It's wonderful to, to be with you all today. Uh, and I, I'd like to actually start um, with a little bit of a reflection. I know um, for, uh, for many of us, I think our encounters with the Eucharist have been quite powerful. I was in adoration last night, kind of up up a little high in the 300s and looking down and I just had this memory of really my first like profound adoration experience in my life. Um, I was 14 years old, I was at a youth conference, I was ugly crying. Um, maybe some of you can relate to that or you have kids that can relate to that or, um, but you know when you feel that kind of that, that surge of um, of, of desire, right? You feel that surge of encounter. You feel, um, and I don't know where you were when this first happened to you. I assume if you're here, it's hopefully happened at some point in your life, but when, when you're in that place where it just feels like this, this canyon or this like abyss of longing is opening up inside of you, and you know that you're insatiable for God and your life isn't gonna be the same. Um, and for me, that was a little 14 year old Anna <laughs> at that conference. Um, and I remember too, at that same conference, I'm like sobbing and ugly crying and someone gave me a Kleenex, some kind hearted youth minister. And I had a friend who came with me and uh, a female friend, and I remember just like, she grabbed my hand, because I think she like, was like, oh, well, she's crying, and that's what you do. Um, she was not as impacted by the moment. Um, and I just remember like having this like sweaty palm, like just gripping her hand and gripping my Kleenex. And I just remember the person on stage was like, well, sometimes when you love the Lord, you just want to reach for him. You want to lift up your hands. If any of you have been to like a charismatic event, you probably know what I'm talking about, right? They gotta guide you. Like, this is what you can do, you know? And I remember being like, but I have a sweaty Kleenex. <laughs> and I don't want to litter on the bleachers. <laughs> and like, my friend is here and I don't, ah, right? Um, but I knew <laughs> But if I wanted to reach for Jesus, I had to let go of things that I was holding on to. You know, and it wasn't until another year later that um, I'd realized that being attracted to other girls was a thing in my life. Um, it had been for a while, but sometimes you don't like really realize it. <laughs> um, so at 15, 16, when I realized that, yeah, like the ways that um, my friends would talk about boys, it's like, ooh, they don't seem that great. <laughs> and actually, you seem pretty great. <laughs> and I'm not really sure what to do about that, you know? And I think when I was that age, um, I was in a lot of really faithful, but also politically active circles. The adults in my life were in those places. And it was around the time of, you know, like the Boston sex abuse crisis, right? That, that news was breaking. There was all these attempts to legalize gay marriage and um, the, the discourse, I think, around sexuality in particular was really intense, was charged. There was kind of this like culture war, us versus them mentality, um, which I'm so glad we're past. <laughs> right, but everything was so loud. You know, everything was so loud and I was just this like 15 year old, 16 year old girl trying to figure things out and I didn't know who could receive me. You know, I didn't really know who was safe. Um, no one was talking about this in my youth ministry settings. I didn't really know another human being that would understand me. Um, but when I turned 16 and I got my driver's license, it was a few months after because I failed the first time, um, I started going to adoration every day. If you couldn't guess, I was, I was a nerd. I was not in any sports or anything. Um, I didn't have to go to practice so I could make it, you know, to 5.30 mass at my parish. Um, and there had been a movement in our diocese to, have, uh, to establish adoration chapels. Um, and so my parish had a perpetual adoration chapel. 
And so I would go um, every day that I could. I was the oldest child, so no one else needed the car. Um, and I would go and I would sit with Jesus in adoration. Um, and I just felt like that that was a place where amidst all of the noise in the world, the like cacophony in my own heart, there was this place, right? This, I could just sink into this place, could just sink into like the womb of the Father's heart, um, present like so poignantly before me in the Blessed Sacrament, and just be in the silence of that little room. Um, you know, and some of my favorite times when I would, I would be there at night, because I guess, I don't know, my parents didn't really like enforce a curfew when I was hanging out at Jesus's house. <laughs> 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 that's great um <laughs> don't stay out too late um but you know those times when there's like actually no one signed up for the late night weird hour and so you're like oh I'm really tired but maybe I could be here alone <laughs> um maybe I could actually I could sing or something you know <laughs> I don't know if anyone does that I do um <laughs> but it was just such a precious time right? I pour out my heart God bless anyone who stumbles over those journals. <laughs> Probably still like buried at my parents' house somewhere. You know, but, but I would just be with him, right? And I would pour out my heart to him and I would, I would ask him why, <laughs> right? Um, I would feel terrible about all of my like fantasizing and my masturbation. I would tell him about that, you know? And I, and I would just like tell him what I was feeling and, and just tell him too, like how much I wanted him. And how much I wanted to be with him. You know, I think so much of my own life um, and, and all of our lives in different ways, right, has been really marked by desire. And sometimes by competing desires. Anyone in the confession line can relate to that, right? <laughs> um, you know, I think sometimes that can feel really complicated. You know, and I think when we think about those complicated desires, um, you know, I, I do want to kind of make this note at the beginning, like lest you think, oh, she's talking about sexuality and gender, like is she a trustworthy person? You know, <laughs> the church does teach, you know, wisely, right, that there are some desires that we experience that are disordered. Right? In Catholic theology, we call things ordered when they move towards their God-anointed end, their God-appointed end. Um, and the root of that word, order, is ord, which comes from the Latin, which I may be mispronouncing. Bishop, you can uh, correct me. But uh, ordiri, according to etymology online, that's the, <laughs> that's the root. Um, but it means like to begin to weave. And ord is also the root in the word primordial, which is a word we use to mean the beginning, right? Or, or, or before time as we know it really kicks off. And so when it comes to the body, when it comes to sex, there is a primordial order, so to speak, right? Um, that a male person, a female person would unite in the context of an exclusive forever marriage and bring forth new life. Um, you know, and when it comes to, you know, that LGBTQ plus space, there are desires that seem to fly in the face of that primordial calling. Right, whether that's a desire for union, physical union with the same, um, or a desire to be other, right? And these can be very powerful desires that can, they, and they well up in the heart, I think, from a very ancient, ancient, original place. You know, but I think we're all here this week because we know that no matter our own areas, right, of uh, disorder in our own lives, um, and the catechism lists a lot, actually. So if you're interested, I wrote a blog about it. You can find that on the website. <laughs> Newsflash, we all experience it. But we're here not because of those things, right, though they're, they're a part of our experience, but because there's an even more ancient, an even more primordial desire out there in the universe, beyond the universe. And that's God's desire for us. You know, the prayer section of the catechism begins with a callback to the story of the woman at the well. 
Um, and as you may recall, um, in that story, it's in John 4, a Samaritan woman goes to draw water in the middle of the day. And Jesus approaches and asks her to give him a drink. And here's how the church expounds on the deeper meaning of that. This is CCC uh, 2560. Christ comes to meet every human being. It is he who first seeks us and asks us for a drink. Jesus thirsts. His asking arises from the depths of God's desire for us. Whether we realize it or not, prayer is the encounter of God's thirst with ours. God thirsts for us that we may thirst for him. The depths of God's desire for us. You know, here at the Congress, I think we're reminded most poignantly that the Eucharist is the sacrament in so many ways of God's desire, right? When his desire to perfectly unite with us, that will happen in a really particular way in the beatific vision in heaven, is actually realized in just a tiny little way, right? Not just in symbol, not in wishful thinking, but in fact, Right? In the Eucharist, God's desire meets ours, and he slowly, perhaps imperceptibly at first, begins to make us like himself. You know, when I think about my own life as somebody, you know, with an LGBTQ plus experience in the church, um, or my work with Eden Invitation, you know, I think that um, in a lot of ways, not just in our time, but just maybe in general, right? That the people with these experiences, those of us with these experiences, kind of live at this like existential crossroads, right? Like what we uh, desire, be it in sexuality or gender, right? Seems to oppose what's been written into our bodies, right? In their maleness and their femaleness. Um, again, whether that's our experience of our bodies and their maleness or femaleness, femaleness, <laughs> excuse me. Um, Right? Or just our kind of innate um, complementarity right? that exists within our sexual identity. Um, and so when we make a choice for Christ, we live in this like, strange tension. Right? On the one hand, it's like, not like, morally acceptable right? for those desires to manifest right? physically, materially, in the literal manner that we're tempted to want them. And frankly, there's some elements of that that just aren't possible. Right? It just aren't possible, <laughs> right? If a man and a man or a woman or a woman, no matter how much they love each other, right, no child can come from that act, right? Physical life can't come from that, right? The surgeries, the hormones, like nothing is going to create the same functions as if it were naturally occurring in the body, right? I think sometimes when we talk about LGBTQ topics, sometimes we want to just kind of stay in that moral framework. I know we all got kind of quiet right there, right? Because those are like hard things to say in our world today. <laughs> um, but sometimes we want to like stay in the moral framework. Like, like here's what not to do. Here's why. Um, so there you go. Here's your tract. And um, I hope that helps. <laughs> that helps you feel belonging here. <laughs> Right? Or maybe we get into like a socio-political framework, right? Here's what's happening in our culture, here's why it's problematic, here's how we fight it. And those aren't necessarily like bad frameworks, right? I think they can, they can be, they're helpful, they're, they're useful. Um, but at least to me, um, I don't think they're necessarily purely life-giving frameworks on their own. And I think at least for me, there's a particular way that the church's teaching on sexuality and the human person appeals to my heart. I mean, that's the sacramental framework. So we're gonna get a little theological here. Right, we can think of sacraments in the strict liturgical sense, right, the seven sacraments. Um, and in the broader sense, however, right, sacraments are, the catechism says, a visible sign of the hidden reality of salvation. So in that way, we say that Christ himself is what we would call the primordial sacrament. There's that word again, so fun, right? Um, and the incarnation is sort of the, the originator, right, in some ways of the sacraments. Right? It's this visible sign of a human being revealing the hidden reality of God. The church also calls herself the sacrament of salvation, right? And that she's a sign, an active instrument of our communion with God. 
God's communion with us, and also the unity of the human race. And so a sacramental worldview is really seeking to see all of creation, the whole universe, well, or, you know, the multiverse, I guess. I don't know. I read a lot of sci-fi. <laughs> Through that lens. <laughs> Whatever God made, right? Whatever God made. And all of what it means to be human, right? That we as human beings made in the image and likeness of God are also by our very nature visible signs of invisible realities, Right? We image God somehow mysteriously. Right? And that my very life lived in the flesh is meant to encounter grace in a radical way and be drawn upward into the very life of God. And so I think when we talk about the sacramental worldview, I think it's important to note that we are speaking by way of analogy, right? That when we're seeing, we're seeing life through this sacramental worldview lens, it doesn't like confer sanctifying grace the same way an instituted sacrament does, right? Um, but it is a through line, right? It's a pathway. It's a way that God comes to meet us. And um, I don't know how many of you are, you know, like Tolkien fans or that kind of thing. I think you hear about like the sacramental imagination sometimes in certain areas of literature, um, and maybe you feel it, right? This idea that, oh gosh, the created world can like mysteriously convey God's grace to me. Um, I know I, I'm a big hiker and backpacker. Um, and I think some places that's really easy and wonderful to see, right? Like a sunrise can be an encounter with resurrection joy. I mean, I don't know how many of you have ever gone. There was a couple, there was one Easter when I was on the East Coast. I'm a Midwestern girl, but I was on the East Coast and a friend of mine and I, we were like, we're going to go and see sunrise over the Atlantic on Easter morning. We're going to do it. And that was profound. That was this profound moment of just this recollection of the light coming forth in the darkness, right? That God's graces are new every morning. Or has anyone... Um, I don't know if anyone like ever goes outside in a storm. I don't do it a lot due to it being wet, but um, <laughs> there's ways that it can be kind of terrifying, right? Because it's like can cause like death and destruction, right? In this fallen world. But sometimes like you just get out there and the rain is pelting your face and you're just reminded of like the wildness of God's grace. <laughs> and these can be really powerful encounters. Right? But I think all of creation also means like all that it means to be human. Right? Again, that the sacramental worldview recognizes that my life lived in the flesh is meant to be an encounter with grace in a radical way. It's meant to draw me upward into the life of God. And this happens with simple fallen matter. Right? We see this in this, the seven sacraments, right? The water, the oil, the bread, the wine human hands <laughs> laid on people's heads. We see this in the ministry of Christ, right? The loaves and the fishes. Um, or how about when he literally spits in dirt and rubs it on someone's face to cure them? <laughs> right? Or the work of our salvation <laughs> wrought in like a, a scourging flail and wooden beams that I am sure were not sanded and polished, right? Nails with the width of a quarter, right? The sacramental worldview is unafraid of the grit of the earth forming a pathway to the infinite. All right, so the sacramental worldview asks this question, right? How do I let my desire for God meet his desire for me? How do I let the substance of my life, the shape of my life, as it is right now in the present moment, be taken up into that mystery of God? Or perhaps we could say at this conference, you know, how do I let my life be Eucharistic? We find in um, the Gospels, this what I'm going to read is specifically from Matthew 26, uh, these words. While they were eating... Jesus took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and giving it to his disciples said, take and eat, this is my body. For the rest of our time together, I'd like to use that fourfold paradigm of taken, blessed, broken, and given as an analogy for sacramental living in our own lives. 
So I'll just say up front, if you came here looking for like hot tips for your loved ones who are gay, um, come to our booth and talk to us. Um, that's not what this talk is gonna be. And maybe some of you are like, why did you even say the word gay? Come to our booth and talk to us. Um, but, um, <laughs> so we're not really gonna get into some of that, like, we're not gonna get sociopolitical, we're not gonna get pastoral. Um, again, we're happy to have those individual conversations with you, um, but I think what I'd really like to do during our time together is to do what we say all the time, right? I think in a lot of ministry, uh, to people who experience um, whatever, like discordance of sexuality and gender, whatever LGBTQ experience, um, I think we were so quick to say like, this is not your identity, this is not your identity. Um, and I think that's true. Um, but if it's not our identity, <laughs> then we need to see what it's part of. And if it's not our own experience, we need to see how those disparate experiences of sexuality and gender are part of a larger whole. And we need to be able to talk like that to people, right? Um, so we're gonna do that via a sacramental analogy because it's the Eucharistic Congress. <laughs> Taken, blessed, broken, and given. All right, so taken, not the Liam Neeson way. Um, <laughs> that, that's a thriller for those of you who don't know the reference. It's a movie. Um, right, Jesus takes something very created, right? In a way, bread and wine are, are co creations, right? Think of the blessing in the mass, right? When the priest says the fruit of the vine and the work of our hands, right? There's something collaborative happening between a God who provides the growth and a human who prepares, prepares something new from the raw material. You know, when we give Jesus the bread of our lives to become Eucharistic, you know, I think it bears a discussion about what goes into bread in the first place. One of my first jobs was at a bakery, so I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and I come from a family of farmers, though they mostly grew corn, so not wheat, but it works. You have the wheat, right, which literally comes from a tiny you know, bead of a seed, so to speak, pressed into hopefully wet dirt where it's buried, and then it breaks open in darkness. And then the shoot like blindingly climbs towards the warmth and the light of the sun and it bursts through the soil. And if it can avoid drought or blight or drowning in all of our crazy Midwest rain this summer, <laughs> it can soar high. We love pictures of wheat fields. They are so beautiful. And then it's cut down <laughs> by a scythe or a combine if you're in an industrialized society. It gets sorted out, right? The wheat from the chaff, all that. And then the grains of wheat get crushed. Wow. In ancient times, right, this would be a massive millstone, right? Powered by like donkeys or windmills or waterfalls. Now it's like probably some industrial metal contraption. I, I did not Google it, but it gets ground up somewhere. I don't, maybe there's a metaphor for human suffering in there somewhere, I don't know. Because um, now, really, think about, about the bread of our lives. We're really just getting started, right? Because the grains get mixed with all sorts of other ingredients, right? Blended together. Perhaps a metaphor for the outside influences we experience as a human being. And then the dough, right, gets nice and sticky. And then you shape it. Since this is a Eucharistic metaphor, we will not be adding yeast, <laughs> right? Keep things unleavened for our purposes here. Um, but after it's been through all of that, you set it on fire. Or you put it in a box that's on fire, also known as an oven. Um, and you submit it to these extreme temperatures and heat so it chemically changes. Right? The heat works to make something new. Maybe another suffering metaphor. You could pray about that. Right, but this is what Jesus takes to himself. This is what Jesus takes to himself. And not just, you know, our little baptized selves, little baptized baby selves, right? 
Six pound, eight ounce baby Jesus, right? Not just that. That's a Talladega Nights movie reference. Um, but, but every day, right? Again, we're hearing this over and over again. Every day is that invitation. Every day God wants to take us anew to himself. Right? And if the metaphor was not clear enough for you, um, there's this quote from a spiritual writer I love, Carol Hauslander, who reflects on what John Paul II would call you know, the unique unrepeatability of the person. She writes, every living being is himself. Heredity, environment, infant and child experience, opportunity, education or lack of education, friends or lack of friends, countless unpredictable things that we misname accidents or chance. The mystery of all the years and all the people and all the gathered memories, both of individuals and races. Each one of us, as we are, is the material which Christ himself, through all the generations that have gone into our making, has fashioned for his purpose. When we bring the gifts up to the altar at every Mass, this is what we are hand-delivering to our God. Right? We're delivering our hidden darkness, our hungry quest for the light, all the times that we've been torn apart and ground down, all the ways we've been mixed up with the good, with the bad, the fires of adversity that have made us something new, maybe something more nourishing to the world than we ever would have been without it. Right Within the sacramental perspective, I can find my human experience. Right? I can think about my own experiences of, of same-sex desires. Um, or again, those who I know through invitation, right? other divergent experiences of sexuality or gender right? through this lens. Right? And again, I kind of mentioned in that early story uh, the hidden darkness that I felt right? of not understanding my own emotions, right? not knowing how to process them or what to do with them. Um, I've known that hunger, right? And for me, yeah, like some of that is about like wanting to be with a woman, right? Sometimes that is the hunger in a very tangible way, right? Feeling a little stirring when I see a badass lady on a sci-fi show, you know? Um, right, but for me, I think it's also knowing, right, that the feminine that I'm chasing in another woman is a fragment of the infinite perfection of the feminine that's found in God, right? Hunger for more, desire for more, right? Or the grinding down. You know, St. Paul in 2 Corinthians talks about a thorn in the flesh that he begs God multiple times to take away. And God's just like, nope. <laughs> I mean, he says it in, in Greek, I suppose, but... Um, <laughs> Right, that's gonna stay there. It's gonna stay there so you can lean on my strength. Right, I remember I used to pray that like God would take all this away, that if I was like a good girl and did all the right youth group things, all the right ministry volunteering, the right psychoanalytical work, that God would just say, well done my good and faithful servant. Come and receive the seven foot lumberjack I have prepared for you for all eternity. <laughs> Right. Um, okay, which, side note, that's not to say that people that are attracted to the same sex like couldn't marry someone of the opposite sex. Um, we have, there's plenty of marriages like that in Eden Imitation, disclaimer. One of them is in the room, shout out. Um, <laughs> um, my point here is this, right? Like bargaining with God to be more self-reliant usually doesn't work out so well. Um, right. Um, but again, like, and I think we all have these experiences, right? These recurring things that are just maybe part of the grinding, the pressing that, that God permits, right? For our sanctification in mysterious ways. Um, right, because I think we all have this stuff, right? Our own, whatever we want to call it in this metaphor, right? Um, we all have longings in our hearts. We all have ways that we're tempted to compromise, <laughs> right? You know, and I think my hope for anybody with an LGBTQ plus experience and really for all of us would be able to start from this place of acknowledgement, right? That each one of us, <laughs> the bread that we are today, <laughs> right, is the material that God has fashioned for his purpose tomorrow. 
right? What happens next? Christ takes all of that to himself and he blesses us, right? Christ blesses us and he does this in history. He does this in my individual life, right? He does this in history in a particular way. Again, in the incarnation, right? God enters the world, becomes a human person, takes on a body, elevating the human person, right? Um, affirming the goodness of the body, affirming the goodness of our humanity. And he institutes the sacraments, and I want to pay special attention to the sacrament of baptism. Um, do you remember the story of Jesus' baptism? When he comes out of the water, right? The Holy Spirit descends, and Jesus hears the voice of the Father. And God says, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter. This is my beloved child. In the sacrament of baptism, Christ adopts us into his family, the family of God. And these words of the Father are spoken over us, right? They, they transcend everything that came before and they're going to indelibly mark everything that comes after. So another way to put it, right, is our blessedness, well, that what goes into the bread is very important, we need to acknowledge it, but our blessedness kind of like surpasses what goes into the making of the bread, right? And I think this is a, a really important point, right? I mentioned this at the beginning of the talk, but I think, you know, when LGBTQ, LGBTQ topics come up in the church, I think, again, we're, we're very quick to critique um, some cultural concepts of identity, right? Um, and I think there's something really valid, right, in pointing out that these, you know, divergent experiences of sexuality or gender shouldn't be someone's, like, foundational self-concept, right? Um, I also think we can do this with a lot of other things, right? If we examine our own lives, right, our heritage, our country, our professional lives, our hobbies, the roles we have in the lives of our loved ones, um, right, these things are part of the bread, right? They're part of the process, but our blessedness, right, our belovedness as children of God becomes the most foundational thing. It shapes everything that came before and affects everything that comes after because our baptism enacts what we would call an ontological change in us, right? Ontology means like the order of being. So an ontological change alters reality. Something has changed in us that's never going to change back. Right? Again, an obvious example of this we see in the Eucharist, right? The bread and wine become Jesus' body and blood. He doesn't like pop out of it later, you know? <laughs> like, see ya. And this happens at our baptism. Right? The church teaches that baptism seals the Christian with the indelible spiritual mark of belonging to Christ. No sin can erase this mark, even if sin prevents baptism from bearing the fruits of salvation. Right, the church teaches that we'll carry that mark of our baptism into eternity no matter what we did in life, no matter where we end up. Right, God has set his love for us, his confirmation of our blessedness as a seal on our hearts. And we're going to need it because the next word is broken. Um, real quick aside here, you might have noticed that the title for the talk was Broken and Blessed. Um, so I got the idea for framing this talk, like from the words of institution, right? Um, and in my head, I like literally was like, taken, broken, blessed, given. Yes, I am so ready to talk about how God blesses broken things. Totally here for it. And I like created all these beautiful paragraphs for you guys. And then like two weeks ago, <laughs> like literally two weeks ago, I was like, you know, I should like reread the words of institution. I should just like reread them and yeah, because I want to read them in the talk. Um, and as you already know, because I already said it, um, I got the order wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's taken, blessed, broken, and given, right? So all of a sudden, like I'm not going to talk about how God blesses a broken thing. I'm going to need to talk about how God allows blessed things to be broken, Oof. <laughs> right? Um, and we see this quite, and sometimes that's a permissive thing, right? But I think there's also reality that sometimes we see, we see that every liturgy, right? The priest in persona Christi is literally the one snapping the host in half. Um, 
yeah, that happens. <laughs> um, and I think, though, what I th it made me reflect on that word of brokenness. You know, I think, um, I don't know about you, when I think about brokenness, and I think the way we talk about it a lot, um, I think of something, like, wrong, right? You know, you've dropped your favorite mug. It broke. You know, your trust gets betrayed. It's broken. There's something about that word brokenness that I think just, like, reeks of the fallen world in a lot of ways. But I just find it so fascinating that we see this word over and over again in the Eucharistic passages of Scripture. Right? Jesus does that at the institution of the Eucharist. Right? He, he's breaking the bread off, multiplying it in the feeding of the 5,000. He does it with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And yes, we could be, I see there's some priests in the room, we could be technical, biblical scholars about this um, and say that it's because, you know, the breaking of the bread was part of a Jewish Passover rite and that's why he did it, which is true and cool. Um, <laughs> but I think the symbolism is also cool. Um, I don't know, do you guys ever at Mass, like usually it's this at a daily Mass, do you guys ever get this like little thrill, maybe it's just me, when you don't get like a round host? Okay, we're all nerds. We're all Eucharistic nerds. <laughs> I just love it when I get like a, a shard. You know, you're like, this, this, usually it's like a chunk of like the giant hose that the priests use in the consecration. And I just get that and I just think like, oh, like holy, holy, holy. <laughs> right? Holy, 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 like, you broke for me, God. You broke for me. At the cathedral in St. Paul, where I'm from, there's a side chapel that's dedicated to the sacred heart of Jesus. There's a Latin phrase inscribed there, and I looked it up on Google Translate one day. <sighs> Why didn't I just text a priest friend? I don't know. Also, I know that only priests don't know Latin. I know people other than priests know Latin and biblical things. So apologies to the lay theologians in the room. I see you. But according to Google Translate, the Latin said, the church is born from a broken heart. The church is born from a broken heart. You know, when scientists have been able to study Eucharistic miracles, uh, many of you probably know the f what flesh the host has turned out to be, <laughs> right? It's myocardium, the heart muscle, <laughs> right? His heart breaking <laughs> every mass in a manner of speaking, <laughs> right? Christ, Christ takes us to himself. He blesses us. And then I think he extends us an invitation where he says, can your heart break like mine? And I think God wants to break my heart and yours <laughs> in a few ways. All right? He wants to break my heart from attachment to what's sinful. Um, you know, for, for those of us that are same-sex attracted, right? Those days when you feel angry at the church and you crank up your chapel roan and you just want the church to be wrong <laughs> and you want to go your own way. Marry whoever, right? He breaks that open. He breaks me open, right? And says, we'll never be satisfied there, not in that way, right? For those of us who experience gender discordance, those days when you're just so angry about societal gender roles or presentations or expectations, some of which are the results of a fallen world, right? Or those days you can hardly look in the mirror, he breaks that open. You know, come to me. Bring me that pain. Bring that desire. Like, don't harden your heart to me, to my invitation, to your design. Whatever that is in our own lives. He wants to break my heart out of compassion for others. Right? I mean, as, as the president of Enoptation, I've been really radically blessed <laughs> to experience the life stories of just so many different people. <laughs> um, not just those with you know, LGBTQ plus experiences, but also um, their loved ones. 
Um, you know, and I think like he invites me, he invites all of us um, to see past, you know, uh, politics and ideologies and, and assumptions that we might have about what a word means to somebody um, or what a social media post means and look at the person, look at the person in front of me, you know, get curious about their lives and their stories. I think he also wants to break my heart and yours um, from attachment to our own expectations. Um, you know, I think we all have things in our lives that we wish were not part of our bread, <laughs> part of the bread process. Um, and maybe we think that blessing them will like fix it, right? And there's definitely, I'm not like downplaying like the power of grace in, in life. Um, Right? But there's a reality that there's a wound in all of us that like won't go away until heaven. <laughs> um, and that's concupiscence, right? The desire for sin. It doesn't get take, taken away at baptism. It persists in our lives or the world itself, right? Paul says that all creation, you know, waits with this eager groaning and longing for the fulfillment of God's plan, You know, I think God wants to break my heart from my own agenda of how my spiritual journey is going to go. I'm a, I'm a big planner, make a lot of lists, uh, to-do lists. I make strategic plans for my own life. I've written my own eulogy multiple times now. Um, I know where I'm going, God, so it would really be great if you could help me in this five to seven year plan. Hopefully the eulogy won't be in five to seven years. Um, <laughs> God willing. <laughs> um, and he wants to break me of that lie that I have to have it all together, right? That the, the persona, the, the facade is somehow the me that he's trying to reach. You know, and I think the more that our hearts break in these ways, um, from our attachments to sin, from our own expectations, the more our hearts break for compassion for others, the more thoroughly we can be given away. Because that, that's that last word, given, right? I think this is a big part of the whole, whole point of all of this. Um, St. John Paul II is really fond of uh, quoting Gaudium et Spes, that man cannot find himself except through a sincere gift of self. Um, and there's so many ways I think I could talk about the ways that we give of ourselves, but I'm going to stick with the Eucharistic analogy, even though I'm doing great on time, but I'm still going to stick with it. Um, you know, in the Eucharist, I think we experience that gift of God really practically in two ways, um, if we want to be very general about it. You know, he, Jesus offers himself in the Eucharist to be consumed, um, and he offers himself to linger. Christ offers himself to be consumed at Mass, or he offers himself to give us his grace, to heal us, to be a unifying principle of his body, right? We experience a spiritual unity, not, with, not just with Jesus, but through Jesus, with everyone that we're receiving with. Um, and so I think we too are invited, right, to give of ourselves in love for others, right? To, to reach out, um, to heal division in individual hearts, um, in communities, um, to offer ourselves to be to be received, right? To be received by others. Whether they understand the gift or not, right? Isn't that the beautiful humility in so many ways of the Eucharist? Um, I mean, I can't, like there are plenty of masses, I'll put on scandal as anybody, but there's plenty of masses where I'm like, find myself in the communion line. I'm like, oh gosh, we're here already. Okay, Lord, prepare my heart in these five steps before I like actually receive you. I am so sorry. I was thinking about what I wanted for lunch. I'm so sorry. Because this is the best lunch. I'm so sorry. Um, right? No matter how, right? Um, no matter how self-aware someone is when they're receiving your love, you can still offer it. Because that's what Jesus does. <laughs> Um, he also remains with us in a particular way, right, through Eucharistic adoration. Um, and I think this is part of our Eucharistic calling as well, right, to remain. <laughs> you know, I think back um, 
to that 16-year-old girl on the floor of the Adoration Chapel two decades ago. Because when I was alone, I could sit on the floor, not just in a chair. You know? Um, I'm like, can I sit with somebody, right? <laughs> in that same compassion that, that Jesus offered me. Right, like Jesus held me, can I, can I hold her or him <laughs> or they, whatever, however they're naming themselves in that moment? <laughs> can I sit with that person? Offer what I can of my own heart. <laughs> you know, can I be a place of rest for somebody? Can we be that for those uh, in our lives? I think it's also important to note, um, as we're thinking about this idea of givenness, actually the whole movement, really, this whole like sacramental movement, um, so I think it's important to remember that you know, the Eucharist has fundamentally changed, um, but it still looks like bread. To our senses, it still tastes like bread. Um, maybe a bit dry bread, but it's still bread. <laughs> And maybe our lives are a bit the same way. You know, I think it's important to remember in this analogy that we still carry our breadness um, with us in our blessedness. You know, the bread that God um, has allowed us to become. Right? Through the, through the shaping of our individual lives, through our choices, whether it was his active will or his permissive will, if you want to get all theological about it. It's, it's our present moment, right? The bread that God has allowed us to be in this moment, if we allow it to be taken up by him, blessed, broken the way it needs to break, <laughs> to be more and more like the heart of Jesus, Maybe we don't need to be afraid of ourselves anymore. Maybe we don't need to resent the complexity of our stories. Because God is doing a work to make us like himself. And in the loving eyes of providence, nothing is wasted. Right? In the loving eyes of, pro of providence, like sometimes that blessed breadness that we don't always know what to do with is actually the mediation of grace for somebody else. And maybe we wouldn't be able to show up to God's grace the same way if our lives looked different up until now. Or if that thing didn't happen to us in childhood, or if we didn't struggle with that addiction. Or if we didn't dislike our mother-in-law or whatever, you know, <laughs> whatever it is we're carrying. <laughs> Maybe that messy breadness <laughs> that's been blessed and taken up into God can be an offering for others. <laughs> I think to bring it back around a bit, you know, this is my hope for people with an LGBTQ plus experience in the Catholic Church Right, that we wouldn't be a political football. <laughs> that we wouldn't just be the subject of pastoral training talks, which I, I do give those too. Um, but <laughs> right, that we wouldn't just remain this like phantom other that no one knows with, what to do with, and we like kind of pretend isn't in the pews. <laughs> um, right, my hope is that every single one of us can see ourselves as sacramental people. That every single one of us can believe that we are taken into the bosom of the Father. That, that every single one of us, maybe some of us aren't baptized, but if you do get baptized, um, that our indelible baptismal blessing can animate everything that we do. My hope is that every single one of us can allow God to break our hearts in all the right places. 
and that we can allow ourselves to be given away. And that our very lives, right, lived in the frail human flesh that God has given us becomes a means to encounter grace in a radical way. And that through it, we can be drawn upward into the very life of God. Let's pray. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, I pray for the grace for all of us, for everything I just said that maybe should have been the prayer. <laughs> Lord, thank you for the ways that we're fearfully, wonderfully made. Thank you for the ways that you work all things in our lives to your good. Give us the grace, Lord, to be a Eucharistic people, to our, allow our own lives to be taken up by you. And Lord, that as we experience your blessing on us, that we'd be able to offer ourselves in love and to offer to others in our lives um, perhaps those we came to this talk for, maybe, <laughs> um, to offer them that same grace, God, that you extend to us. And Lord, we pray that the more and more that we're conformed to you and to your heart, that our lives would be offered up to you for your glory as we pray. All glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Um, um, one, just a couple quick, like really practical notes. Um, Shannon, do you want to talk about eat invitation, or do you want me to do it? I'll do it. Okay, great. Uh, so for those of you that are interested, maybe um, you came to this talk thinking it would be more practical or, or something. Um, just a little bit of background. So Eden Invitation, we are um, really, we're a ministry, but I think more fundamentally, we're a community for um, uh, Christians, Catholics who have experiences like on that LGBTQ plus spectrum. Um, we really try to offer opportunities for people at various different stages of faith to like connect with us, um, to get to know us, to get to know a little bit more about, um, just the ways that Christ invites us to abundant life. Um, we offer online and uh, in-person small groups. We have annual retreats, um, uh, an online community, um, and I also do um, some speaking in different places. Um, and so we are here uh, at this conference um, to just kind of be, a, be of service. Really. Um, so if you have, I'll, I'll be waiting um, afterwards. I'll, I'll stand over here. If you have individual questions about your own life or the life of a loved one or anything like that, I'm more than happy to have some individual conversations. We also have five people here from our team, myself included, um, that are work in the booth. <laughs> We're right across from the giant styrofoam, the cathedral, right? The church down there where we have a green background because Eden invitation, get it? Leafy. Um, and so you're more than welcome to come and chat with us at any point um, throughout this weekend. So you have questions about us, um, if you have questions about our ministry, if you have questions about um, the church's teaching or, or approaches, or again, something more personal in your life or in the lives of someone you love, um, that's a big part of why we're here. And so we're um, super happy to talk to you about any of that. Um, so thank you for coming. Uh, have a great conference. Bye. <laughs>